I'm rocking with G Sports. Joining me on the G Sports Zoom today, uh, Florida State running back coach, Coach Dave Johnson. Coach, man, appreciate you taking the time out your busy schedule, man. Uh, I know y'all got practice and stuff going on, trying to get ready for a season. Uh, to take the uh, time out your busy schedule, man, to come on the Zoom with me and kind of talk some ball and a little bit about your coaching journey. Man, I really appreciate you having me. <laughs> uh, man, with everything that's been going on with the, with the pandemic, coronavirus, Black Lives Matter, I mean, you name it, it's been going on in 2020, man. Just talk about how you've been dealing with this in 2020, uh, with your family, with uh, past players that you coach, and with your new staff over there and your new players over there at Florida State. Well, well obviously, it's been a big adjustment, and then, uh, especially with us, we were able to uh, actually only have three days of uh, spring practice, so you're trying to get to know these kids and you're really trying to pour into them. But our kids are doing a really good job with the Zoom and kind of keeping up with everything, you know, with my family. It's been a rough time. Uh, my mother-in-law passed uh, probably like two months ago uh, from the virus. So, you know, as a family, but we've really been kind of going through it and kind of staying prayed up. And uh, a lot of different players been calling me. And actually, they've been checking on me and my family, man. So, and different coaches and everything. And this is a different time, you know. And I just thank God just really talking to us and telling us we got to spend more time with each other got to be more passionate and compassionate with each other, man. I just think uh, you have to sit back and really realize what's important. And that's what I think a lot of us doing. Uh, what about, like, with your, with your players right now at Florida State? What's some advice and, and, and kind of some things you've been kind of doing with them as far as, like, educating them and informing them uh, with the pandemic, you know, uh, just trying to stay safe? Also, and also with the Black Lives Matter movement, with everything that's been going on with Breonna Taylor and, and everything else. I, I think our head coach did a good job of kind of allowing our guys to have a voice uh, of their own, you know, especially through social media. You know, you know our biggest thing is telling them to make sure they're smart uh, when they're doing things like that. You know, we've just been educating these guys and understand that, you know, they have power and allowing them to know that what power they do have and using it in the right way. Uh, as far as the pandemic going on, we just try to tell them to be safe. Uh, the basics, man, man, just have a mask on. Obviously, we can't just sit you in a room and lock you up all day. So when you do go out, be smart, be mindful, don't go with a group of people, and you know? understand what's going on. You know, at this point, it's a virus. You can't see it. So, right. So you, know, you just have to, you have to follow instructions and directions. And I think our kids have been doing a good job. Obviously, our coaching staff have been doing a good job. But our kids, when you really started talking to them about the Black Lives Matter and different things like that, they really truly voiced their opinion and, and different things that they want to do. That's one thing about this generation. Uh, they have so much information. They want to be heard. Uh, unlike when I was young, you know, it was like, you know, just kind of sit in the corner and we're going to tell you exactly what to do and how to do it. And that's just how we were raised. But with this young generation, they, they have a voice. And uh, we have to embrace that. And, uh, and obviously we have to advise them in the right way, but uh, I just think these kids and young people are doing a good job and they're our next leaders. Dave, I know you you had a prior relationship with Coach Norvell when you was at Memphis and y'all had a lot of success when you was there. And then you moved on to Tennessee and Norvell kept, you know, kept it ticking over there in Memphis and, and kept that thing rolling. And now he got the job at Florida State and you got to uh, kind of rekindle uh, that relationship with him at Florida State now. Talk about coming to Florida State with Coach Norvell, y'all relationship, and trying to get the Seminoles back to prominence like it used to be, man, back in the 90s when Peter Warren was there. LeBernie All the boys from the boot was there, man. You had Warwick Dunn, man. You had Sean Jackson. You had Minor. You know, uh, you had so many different people, man, who was there kind of, kind of doing their thing. And actually, Coach Odell uh, always tell me about this. He did. We kept five, six dudes from the boot. You know, uh, but first, our relationship with Coach Norvell, man, uh, and a lot of people don't know this. My first year at St. Aug, uh, he actually came in. It was his first year being a receiver coach. It was my first year being a head coach. That's when we met, 2009. He came in. We talked. I told him about the players we had. I told him I really appreciated him uh, coming to recruit our guys. You know, I, I was really big on guys coming out of school and recruiting our kids. But I told him about everybody else in the city. I said, look, Coach, I'm from here. I know these kids. So the next year, he invited the, his head coach to come meet me, invited the whole staff. 
And that guy told me in 2010, he said, Dave, one day I'm going to be a head coach. And I'm going to hire you. I said, look, coach, I don't want anything. I said, I'm glad my kid's going to school for free 99, man. I said, you don't have to give me anything. And 2011, after the 2011 season, I left to go to uh, Tulane with CJ. I hadn't talked to Novell probably like four or five years. We got fired on a Friday at Tulane. I thank CJ for the opportunity that he gave me. Novell got the job on Sunday. He called me. He said, Dave, I got a head coaching job. I just want to see if you want to be interested, man. Send me a plane ticket. Dave, I ain't tell you where I was at. At this point, it don't matter. Better send me a plane ticket. He hired me in, uh, in December. Uh, I got on with him, one of the first coaches to go down there and recruit with him. And actually, that January, when Frank Wilson left LSU, I had an opportunity to actually come back home. But I told Norvell, bro, you know, you gave me an opportunity when I didn't have one, bro. I think loyalty goes a long way. You know, I told him I'm going to stay with him, uh, and I, I appreciate him having me. I learned a lot from him. Uh, I think we had a really good relationship. And uh, the reason I was able to kind of leave Tennessee, my, it's closer to home for my family. That was a big family move for me. I really enjoyed myself at Tennessee. I learned a lot from Pruitt. I mean, Pruitt taught me a lot being in the SEC. You know, I was just a different animal, different beast. So I learned a lot, man. But uh, with Norvell, man, I understand what he wants. Uh, offensively, and I just wanted to continue to learn more on this offensive side and put my family in a better situation, you know. And with, with Coach Norvell coming in, I know he understands Louisiana and, and how important it is to, get, to kind of dab in that state a little bit and get some of them, get some of them top tier players. Um, what, what are some things like far as like trying to be proactive? You know I, know, I know you just got the job, you know, less than a year ago. And what are some things y'all doing? to try to kind of rekindle that flame of getting them guys from the booth back to back to Florida State and, and kind of, like I say, getting Florida State back to prominence like it used to be. Well, actually, when I first got there, you, uh, you already had the kid from uh, Terrebonne. You had Ja'Kai Douglas. Uh, he's already here. Corey Wren just came. I got Corey Wren from John Curtis. So we got some boys from the boot immediately. You know, that was a priority for us. They're hard workers. And you know, like anything, you, you take care of the kids that you recruit they're going to recruit for you. So it's on me once they get here for me to kind of really help them out uh, to nurture them and do the right things by them uh, on and off the field. Uh, when I'm able to do those things, everything else will take care of themselves. And obviously we're in the state of Florida where we love recruiting, where you have so many athletes. So you just right. want to try to go in a booth, try to get you one or two, you know, every now and then and you're good, man. But uh, I think the, the kids that we did get from Louisiana, uh, I think Corey and Chicago are going to be really good. I know – you turned down LSU. I got, I got, I got to ask you this, D, bro. Uh, with you being from Louisiana, how hard was it for you to tell LSU no? Well, I don't, I don't think it was so much about telling them no. I think in this coaching game, what people don't understand is all about timing. It's all about the right fit. Uh, I really appreciated uh, Les Miles at the time, and most people don't know that my last year at Tulane, I actually interviewed for the job at LSU, and I interviewed for a very long time with Les. And Les actually told me, Dave, it's not this time. You're not going to get the job this time. I'm trying to get you to know you for the next time. And I didn't realize that next time was going to be like six months later. And uh, it would have been something I think would have been really comfortable for me to come back, try to recruit in Louisiana. But, you know, once I got to Memphis, I had to show some type of loyalty to a guy who just gave me a job when I didn't have one. I had to understand that. And I, and I think, you know, I, I was able to grow. You know, in the first year in Memphis, it was out of my comfort zone. But I was able in those two years at, at Memphis to get 12 kids from the boot, you know, really contribute, did a, you know, did a wonderful job uh, at Memphis right now. Coxie may pass up Anthony Miller record. He may be the leading receiver. I was able to, to kind of steal Coxie away from Louisiana. But at the end of the day, I think it was the, the best thing for me and my family at that time. Uh, and, and obviously, everybody knows, man, LSU is a, a great place. Obviously, it's home, you know, but – I just think at the time, my time and everything was was what best for me and my family. Right, right. And speaking about uh, Demonte Coxie, man, I mean he been tearing it up at Memphis. Uh, Quindell Johnson, an another guy you recruited from the boot. <laughs> think, what, what, Dave? What, what's some challenges when you recruiting kids from the boot? That's that's kind of you know when you four five hours or more away from your house. In Louisiana, what what's some what's some challenges that you probably fa that you face sometimes with some of these kids getting them from the booth to try to come when you was at Memphis, Tennessee, and not Florida State? I, I think the biggest thing uh, 
the distance sometimes, and you know, kids from Louisiana, they always want to be somewhere familiar to them. Uh, and I just think, you know, those guys at LSU do a really good job of recruiting. You know, uh, you, you're fighting against Alabama when it's real close. You got Cortez Hankton at Georgia, you know, so it's, it's always a fight. But my thing is, I just try to get the kids who want to be at the school I'm at. Whatever school I'm at, man, I tell kids all the time, man, go where you celebrate it, not tolerate it. You know, at the end of the day, uh, we have, have an opportunity to coach. I try to coach them to the best of my ability. I just try to take advantage of it. And a lot of guys, you don't hear about them till late. Demonte Cox, it was a, a guy people thought, but they kind of fell off and all of a sudden, you know, for the Belinda Call for Award. Uh, when I first got to Memphis, you know, Anthony Miller was a walk-on. You know, he was second round <laughs> draft pick. Yeah, he was a walk-on. He broke every record in school history. Wow. So to me, I tell guys all the time, take advantage or every opportunity you have, uh, whatever's going on, like my dad always told me, man, play the hand you dealt. So I'm always just grateful for whoever I can recruit, uh, whoever allowed me to coach them and be a part of their life. Dave, I remember this probably was, I don't remember what year it was. I just know Carl was getting ready for the state championship at the, at the uh, same facility. You was at Memphis at the time. And you came in there, you were talking to, you know, T. Howard and, and, and some of them guys on the staff. And I heard you say a story, and I, I've actually repeated this story to a couple of people that, that's trying to get into the coaching game. When you was at Millsap about sleeping in your car. Yeah. Uh, that was after Hurricane Katrina. Talk about that sacrifice, man. Going to Millsap, you know, <laughs> with that Millsap is an NAIA? Millsap is a Division three school in Jackson, Mississippi. Division uh, three. Yeah, and what happened – uh, actually, you know, the storm was about to hit. We actually evacuated to, to Houston. We stayed there for a week, then we drove to uh, Ole Miss. And the reason we drove to Ole Miss, Frank was there. Frank was taking – Frank Wilson was taking care of everybody. Frank Wilson had got us a house. We had a three-bedroom house. It was 26 of us in a three-bedroom house. Wow. 26 of us, all my wife, family members, and my son at the time, seven, eight months. So I got a call from a former college coach to say, Dave, I got an opportunity at Millsaps College. I had never heard of Millsaps. And I said, well, listen, Coach. I said, man, I'm going to be a GA. I'm going to be over the receivers. He said, no, Dave, you're going to be over the receivers. So the trip from Jackson, Mississippi to Oxford is a two-hour trip. Frank Wilson said, Dave, get in the game. Just get in. I don't care what he's doing. Just get in the game. I packed the car, told my wife, I'm going to take this opportunity. And she was like, you sure? I said, listen, I'm going. An hour into the trip, the coach called me. He said, hey, Dave, uh, I didn't tell you. I said, what happened? I said, look, man, I'm, over, I'm almost down. I'm an hour away. He said, Dave, I'm going to pay you $500 a month. I said, I don't care. He said, don't make – and a lot of people don't know. I'm 30 years old at this time, and I have two older children. Plus, I just had Karaz and I'm married. So I'm going strictly off of faith. I get there. When I get there, he showed me everything. I get, try to go to the hotel, which is next door. I show him my license, credit cards, everything. Once they see my license, I was from New Orleans, so you can't stay here. I said, I have a credit card. I'm not on no voucher. Then I got cash. It wouldn't let me stay there. So my mindset was, look, man, I'm about to get it. I said, I slept in my car, and I tell people all the time, I wasn't homeless. I was the first person at work. <laughs> really like that. And then you know our mentality from New Orleans, man, get me in that building. And I was able to get in that building, man. The first year, we only won two games. The next three years, we won the conference championship. And I, I brought like 15 kids from Louisiana out there. Like 15 kids with all conference, did everything up there. So to me, it was a blessing. And I tell people that all the time, man, only two things happen to you in life, lessons and blessings. And that was truly a blessing for me. And I thank uh, Millsaps for allowing me to be there. And, and my wife look at that today and like, I don't know how we got here. A lot of people don't go $500 a month. And I slept in my car, man. I had a camera, no air, whatever, man. It was, I'm good. I'm going to make it happen. Would you, would you, I think it's safe to say that was probably the turning point in your coaching journey. Would you, would you agree with that? Yes. And, and a lot of people don't know. Uh, I drove, my wife moved back after maybe like seven, eight months. She moved back to New Orleans. So we were living on the West Bank and she was, she, my wife's a nurse, a kid, a nurse. So I would drive from Jackson, Mississippi to New Orleans three times a week to go back and forward. So my last year, I started to fall asleep on the road. I was uh, coming out of Macomb. And the next thing, the last thing I remember was Macomb, Mississippi. The next thing I remember was Ham, welcome to Ham. 
So I was falling asleep. So I went back and told Coach Mike DeBow, I said, Coach, this is it for me. I can't do it anymore. This is my last year. He said, Dave, don't go back to high school. I said, Coach, not even about going back to high school. I'm falling asleep on this road. I got to go back home to my family. I said, I tried this. And what happened, man, I was blessed again, bro. I get home and I do what? I get the St. Aug job. The job that, you know, wasn't attractive at the time, didn't win a lot of games. But I tell people all the time, I hit the jackpot. Tyron Matthews is a senior, Leonard Fournette in the eighth grade. It made it look like I knew how to coach. You know? Talk about that experience at St. Aug, man, where, you know, you saw Leonard come up as a pup. And you saw that maturation process from, from Tyron. I, I mean, I remember Tyron. We all know he was a good player, but, you know, it was question marks about his size and the speed and all of that. And I guess he proved everybody wrong. I think it's safe to see that. Uh, talk about your, your, your experience at St. Aug them, them few years and, and your relationship with, with Leonard and, and Tyron and how you kind of played a part into mentoring them into the, the men they are today. I think the biggest thing is when I get to uh, – <clears throat> when I was about to accept the uh, St. Aug job, I called the defensive coordinator, Dale Lee. I said, D, look, man, they offered me this job. The only way I'm going to really take this job, I'm going to need you. I said, you're going to be my assistant head coach. You're going to be over the defense. So I really asked Dale Lee to make sure he stayed. Him and Tyron have a special relationship. So as he's telling me how good Tyron is, and I haven't seen him, you know, the years before, kind of seven on sevens. But the first day I got on that field, I had a kid run a post corner on him, and I'm talking to Tyron. I'm talking about what we're going to do him. Man, he flipped his hips, caught the ball with one hand, and looked at me and threw the ball at me. Like, Coach, you better do something else. And I would tell people this, even before, you know, I was like, man. And Dale Lee would always say, man, Dave, I've been telling him. I say, Lee, what they're not seeing in this Catholic League, Tyron is a really good defender, but they don't see him with the ball in his hand. So basically, I used to tell T, I said, Tyron, you're going to go both ways. The very first game we get to is West Jeff. West Jeff ranked number two in the state. I said, Ty- Tyron, get off. I said, Coach, I thought I was going both ways. I said, Yo, I see, I don't know the play. See, you don't know the play. I'm going to put four receivers on one side, put you on the side by yourself, and you can go check this. It's five seconds before half. I go quiet, right? I said, T, get in the game. Coach, just get in the game. If I do this, run a hitch. If I do this, run a fade. He ran a hitch, caught the ball, went 60 yards for a touchdown. He was laughing. I said, You better than them. It's my job not to mess it up. And I tell people that all the time. He is the best player I've ever seen in my life. He is, the, he is the best player I have ever seen up close in my life. I've never seen a young man who loved football more than him. He came prepared. Dale Lee did a really good job, man, early on. And my job was to put him in a situation, bring him to these camps. And a lot of people don't know, he went to camps and people were just like you. He's too small, but Coach, he ran a full cell. I said, I don't care what he ran. I didn't see a person catch a ball on him. So, and he was just so mentally tough and he believed so much in himself, he didn't worry about what other people thought. And when he got at the opportunity, when Les Miles said, hey coach, I'm offering him. I told him, I said, Les, if you offer this kid, he's gonna commit now. So he came and said, Dave, I'm offering. And the rest is history, man. That kid worked extremely hard, bro, and did the things he needed to do. He's doing a really good job with his community, bro, and being a leader for everybody, bro. So I tell those kids all the time, I just thank God for him. And then to have Leonard in the eighth grade when Tyron was a, a senior, most people, you know, out in the city knew about Leonard. But when them college coaches came to see him that spring, it was like, it is no way he's in the eighth grade. I said, right. He's you. I said, he is a grown man. And Leonard was another one. But you also had Trey Turner on that team, who was a junior. You also had Lorenzo Dawson on that team. And my ball boy, who played on the freshman team at the time, was Stanley Morgan. So you had dudes on that team. I just tell people, most people say, Dave, you always had good players. I say, one thing you can say, though, I don't mess them up. I don't <laughs> think they wait. I let them be good. So I, and I tell people all the time, it's not my cone drills, bro. God has really blessed me with some really good kids, man, to be honest with you. I, will, uh, I, I did the Zoom interview with uh, Coach Jabal Jalou on last week. And, uh, man, we were just kind of reminiscing about his coaching journey and this is what he told me about, too. He told me that you really didn't want to be a coach. He said you wanted to be a principal. So I'm like, I, I, <laughs> Most I people don't know that, man. I was I, in school at the time to be a principal at soon, though. Me, you know me and Jaluk work at the YMCA? We were middle school teachers. That's the story he was telling me. That's the story he was telling me. He said, he was like, I said, we were talking about you and Frank. And I said, Dave's so passionate about the game. I said, I can't see him not Want to be a coach? He was like, gee, I was a talker. 
He said, I'm telling you, we used to work at the YMC together, and I used to be telling him, like, bro, stop acting stupid and come cool. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> he said, you used to be like this, man, I'm going to be a principal. So kind of take me through that. You know, you thought you were the principal, but kind of things change, and you ultimately was a, wanted to be a coach at the end of the day. But I think the big – most people don't know I started off coaching at Kennedy in 98. I coached Devin Lewis, Cheeky, who uh, played at Southern and wound up playing for the Green Bay Packers. Then I got out of it. Just wasn't – I didn't think it was a good fit for me, but I was always a teacher. I was all – especially those kids from the YMCA. Man, I just had – I had those little sixth graders, man. I used to have them in line. You look like, dog, you be on them. I said, bro, I love teaching these kids. And he kept telling me, dude, just come with us at walk. I said, bro, I'll come and help out. And then when Frank talked to me, I actually uh, went to Frank and Jaluk said, Dave, would you please just come try it for a year? I said, I'm going to try it for a year. And I knew Frank really wanted to go to college. He wanted to coach in college. And I, I, me and Frank went to Nickel State together. So I said, well, I'm going to go help. Well, I fell in love with him. That year I had three receivers that were 1,000-yard receivers, Milton, Buster, and Dallas. So I thought it was me all day. I said, man, I got some nice corn drill. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? My head was big after coaching them guys, bro. But – I fell in love with it, man. I tell young coaches this all the time. After that season, God really humbled me because he made me really realize it wasn't me. And I was, man, I, I was so humble, bro. I prayed to God and said, i never have a big head again about players. And I said, God, I'll always treat them right, and I'll make sure I take no credit. And ever since then, God been sending me good players. Because that very next year, who I had? Michael Wallace. Right. The year after Mike left, who I had? Kendrick Lewis. So, you know, God just keeps sending you good players. You just don't take credit for it. And I tell people all the time, it is not your cone drill. Right, right, right. Uh, Dave, talk about a lot of these black African-American coaches that's coming out of the city of New Orleans that's, that's doing really, really well in college football, in the NFL, with people like Vance Joseph, uh, you know, Jabal Jalou, Tony Hall, Brock Hayes kind of bursting on the scene now. Cortez, I mean, we know about Frank. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. I could, I could go on and on about the, about the, about the co uh, black coaches that come out in New Orleans. What is it about these black African-American coaches in New Orleans that's, that's having so much, so much success in the college game, recruiting, and some of the coaches that's in the, in the NFL? I think the biggest thing what most people don't know, uh, and to me, who kind of inspired me early on, especially when I was at Walker, you know, obviously Frank, without Frank Brown Wilson, I really wouldn't be here. I'm going to be honest with you. The dude really groomed me. I'm to my on and off the field. But a lot of people don't talk about CJ. They don't talk about Curtis Johnson, dog. He was one of the best recruiters before all this recruiting stuff even started. You know, he recruited Marshall Falk. He recruited Reggie Wayne, Ed Reed, all these guys, bro. And he was the first one to kind of start this. And really, to me, he was the first person I saw kind of made me believe, okay, I may have a chance to get there. And when, when he started, then you start talking about Cortez Hankton. When me and Cortez Hankton, when he was young, we used to be at Harrell Park working him out, you know, when he was at St. Paul. Tony Hall, you know, who I, when I first got to St. Paul, he was one of the first coaches. I tried to hire him away from Orin Easton. And he decided, which was a good decision, to stay at East and continue that. Uh, Quan Drake, man. Drake, who's my D-line coach, bro. I just got the phone with Drake, one of the best <laughs> D-line coach, best D-minds. Brock, who I continue to learn from. You got a little Dwayne Taylor, who just coming up. He's at the junior college. My receiver, uh, uh, Larry Dates, he's coaching up on the East Coast. So it's so many. The, the, the O-line coach, actually, uh, from uh, he's from Baton Rouge, but he's O-line coach at Arkansas. But it's so many different coaches. And look, look who won the Super Bowl. Look at the offensive coordinator, Eric Benham. A lot of people don't know, before I went to Tulane, for a whole week, Eric Benjamin spent with me to help me learn how to coach running back because he knew that's how I was going to coach at Tulane. So Eric Benjamin, bro, he's another guy, when you look at these different coaches, you're like, man, these guys come from the same city. How can so many of them get out? And one thing we try to do, we try to really respect each other. We try not to get caught up in what's going on. And I was, we always call Frank the godfather of this. You know, he kind of put all of us on the map, you know. So, at the end of the day, man, I tell people all the time, but Jabal Jalou got me into coaching, man. At Walker, with just so many good kids. Like, I tell people, Michael Wallace was sitting on the bench as a junior. Like, people don't like, how was he sitting on the bench? I said, dog, the other three dudes I had were beasts. And I say, Michael Wallace scored 36 touchdowns this senior year. 
And when Mike was rolling, Kendrick Lewis was sitting on the bench. So it was just so many kids in that, in that era who did a really good job. And one job that I took, I had left Walker in 2004. 2005, right before the storm, me and Brandon Williams, the offensive coordinators at St. Aug. That's when we had Chad Jones, Ryan Montague. We had all these kids that the, the season left, you know, because of the storm, but they went on other places and did a really good job, man. Uh, but we had a really good team that year. And actually, Coach Payne was the one to first get me to St. Aug. Now, to kind of go back to Walker and kind of go back to a statement you made earlier, you said Tyron Matthew was the best football player you've seen. He was better than Daryl Johnson. That's what I was about to ask you. <laughs> but look, I told Daryl Johnson that when, when I first saw Tyron, I called DJ. I said, DJ, this dude was better than you. He was like, Coach, I said, DJ, you know I ain't gonna lie, bro. You was the best player I've ever saw. I said, this dude have a skill set. And I think Daryl was more of a superstar because of what was going on at Walker. You know, that was like, it was a little different for, for Tyron, bro. And I think the greatest play, for most people, I never see the greatest play he ever made in high school. It wasn't a pick. It wasn't no fumble. The greatest play I've ever seen him make was in a playoff game. He playing against Duke Johnson. Actually, the guy plays for the Bills now. Went to East St. John. There's probably a minute left in the game. We up by four points. They throw a 70-yard bomb and complete it on Tyron. He run the kid down and tackle him on the five-yard line. The next play they fumble, we get the ball back. Any other kid would have gave up. Any other kid would have stopped. But that kid just did whatever it took to win. And he was going to – whatever we needed him to do, he was going to do it. I remember uh, – I think that was his senior – I think it was his senior when y'all played Tipper Ohio when y'all went against Trevine Reed. Yeah. I mean, that was a suit. That and he had returned the kick. They called a kick back. And my wife going crazy, talking about they cheating. You know, so that was – and all – and then you had Robinson, you had Reed, you had Trey, you had Tyra, Lorenzo, Dahl. All them guys played in the NFL from that one game. Greg Robinson? Yeah, that was it. Greg Robinson, old lineman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dave, you done had some nice experiences in, in high school, college. What's Dave Johnson's end game before he called it quick? Before he, but when you ready to say, look, baby, I'm done coaching. I'm ready to just put my feet up. Go sit on the beach, drink some margaritas, and just enjoy it. Like, what, what's your end game before you get ready to do that? I, I, I think eventually uh, I, I want to be someone who uh, being able to be a motivational speaker. Continue to help kids, though. You know, if, I, if I'm going to get out of this as a, on the coaching side, I want to continue to help our young people, man. I just think that's important, uh, especially when you're able to kind of touch so many people in a positive way. And that's, that's the biggest thing, man. I tell people all the time, bro, I'm going to still wind up being the principal. They can say what they want. I'm going to find a way to get back down there and be a principal somewhere. And so many people laughing like, Dave, you like a real teacher? I'm like, yeah, I was a real teacher. I had to show my plaques. So I'm like, I will teach you the year. That's the why. But uh, being in those situations and seeing those kids now, how they're growing, that was, that was just a blessing to me, man. And I tell so many of my players, man, when I see Leonard and Tyron and all these guys, I just really thank them. You know, I, I do, man. Honestly, man, I was just really blessed to be in that situation. And it's crazy. The last time I coached at St. Louis was 2011. My whole coaching staff, we still on the same text. We text each other every day. All of us. We've been texting each other every day since 2011. You know, so it was a bond, man. And I think uh, the people at St. Augustine High School just did a really good job. Uh, that's one thing, bro. When I win the lottery or something, bro, I'm going to donate a ton of money to them and my school. Because most people think I went to St. Al. I have to let them know I went to John Fitzgerald Kennedy College Prep. I went to the K. And, and like, look, and, and, and Lanera's L. Face Sr. just got the head coaching job. Over yeah. Him. I texted him, man. He wanted, he wanted the best high school football players I ever seen. Uh, I've been watching. I'm, 30, I'm 36 years old. I've been watching high school football since 95. Oh, 94, somewhere around there. I was in the fourth grade. But I remember the first time I seen Linares play, they came, they had to play, play a terrible in the first round of the playoffs. Him and Fred Stamps. Yeah. And they was running a spray before the spray was even invented back then. That's right. Stuff I see Linares do in that game, I thought I was watching Michael Vick, Pat Mahomes all in one. You know what I'm That's saying? That's right. Uh, you know, I know he got the head coach job over there at your alma mater, man. So I know that I kind of make you happy. 
How yeah, you? man, he's gonna do, he's gonna do a great job over there, man. He really dedicates to the city, dedicates to these kids, and that's what they look for, bro. They're looking for some type of structure. Dave, a lot of high school kids, parents, you name it, they they ask me all the time, man, what are these college coaches looking for when they evaluate? What what are some traits they looking for when they come to a spring practice or when they watch a game or when they watch in the huddle film? Dave, I think you you one of the most respected evaluators. Um, that I, that that I've that I've got a chance to 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 watch and follow over the years, um, you know when you offer a kid and and when you when you step a kid, that kid's usually legit. So what's what's some things you kind of look for when you evaluating the kid and, and kind of looking for certain treats? I, I think the biggest thing, bro. I think so many times right now we're getting away from the simple things. You know, the dude who making all the plays when you go to the game. That's a dude you want to recruit. It's just that simple. You don't make this thing harder than what it is, bro. Obviously, you see a dude running four, three, he's six foot four, and all. Yeah, that's the obvious. But the kid, when you watch him play, again, you go back to Tyron Matthews, who's five foot nine, bro, 160 pounds at the time. But when you see him play, you're like, look, man, that's a dude I want on my team. Uh, and so many kids, I get a chance to offer them early a lot of times. And most people sit back, well, I'm going to see, man, I see him. I don't need nobody else to tell me who can play and who can't play. But one thing I do tell parents all the time and tell a lot of kids, well, a, a few things. When I come to the game and I'm really recruiting and I offered you and I think I'm, I'm trying to get you in the boat to commit, I won't watch you. I won't watch you when y'all losing. I won't watch your mannerisms on the sideline. See, that's going to tell a lot about me. See, when I go in there in school, I'm not just talking to the coach. I'm going I'm to sit back. I'm going to talk to the janitors, especially being from New Orleans. I'm going to know everybody there. And some of them are going to let me know, hey, Dave, I don't know about this one, bro. <laughs> you know, they're going to let me know, hey, we kind of good on that football field, but he got a little problem with him. So I'm going to know what's going on. I just tell kids, be mindful of what you're doing. And every day is an interview for you. And also, when they come to camp, because most kids will tell you, well, coach, I'm not coming to camp. I'm cool, I don't even have to come to camp. But when you come to camp, this is how you got to look at it. I have a blank check. I'm going to write this check to somebody. Now, if it's you or somebody, I got a blank check I'm writing to somebody. So I just try to tell them at the end of the day, bro, if you come to play, especially the position I'm coaching, whatever position I'm coaching, running backs, receivers, I'm going to test you out. Now, if you don't have the mindset for it, well, it's probably not going to work out for you. So most kids get, well, I don't want to go to camp. I don't want to do this. I said, bro, you have to compete. That's what this is about, bro. It's a business. At the end of the day, this is a big-time business. So I'm, I can't just go around recruiting my friends or people I think, cool, you have to kind of know what you're doing. And academically, bro, you got to kind of see if those kids are straight and how they fare in that situation, man, about going to class. And I'm, I'm real straight with them. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm, when I'm talking to kids and they about, I say, listen, bro, if you're a left-hand smoker, I don't want you. So I'm just telling them, being, I, and, and their parents, I say, I'm being straight with you. I'm going to shoot you straight, bro. If you into all that, I don't need you. you right. Know, so, of the day, bro. I don't want them to call your parents back and tell them you're on your way home. I said, we can be straight with each other, man. I just want you to do do your best, and it's my job to take care of you. Me and Coach Bryce Brown, we were talking about you a couple weeks ago, and we was just talking about, you know, college coaches not kind of like not trusting the eyes, not trusting what they're seeing. And you are not one of them people. Uh, they got a number of kids that you will offer first, and people be like, like, what this kid is they offering? Then next thing you know, the kid is ranked top ten in the country. You know, that's how not everybody I, coming. Not everybody coming. You know what I'm saying? And so now, when you talk to college coaches, you talk to high school coaches, you talk even talking to kids. When Dave offers somebody, like he got. <laughs> well, that's what they do now, and I tell kids that though. I say, look, bro, this how this gonna work now. I say, I'm off. I said, I already know you're going to play. And I said, I'm going to off you, and I'm going to back off about two or three months. Cool. I said, look, bro, I'm not into all that. And I tell a kid, look, bro, me calling and texting you all, me ain't doing all that. We have a real relationship. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to make sure I talk to your parents. But all that just stuff, just to be doing it, I'm going to have to do that. But we got to keep it 100 with each other, man. I'm going to be your coach. I'm not going to be your friend. You know, and at the end of the day, them kids like, cool, this one off me now. I said, I told you it was coming. And they're going to tell you how you're going to the pro. You say, Cole, that's what they be telling me. They're going to get me in the pros. I said, they're not going to get you in the pros, bro. I said, the only thing going to get you in the pros is Dana. And they're like, Dana, yeah, your DNA. That's it, dog. It's all you, man. Not they con drills, bro. I don't believe all that. And I, 
And actually, Leonard did something on uh, Twitter not too long ago, and he brought me up. I had showed him a trick. I actually was in the ninth grade. We had the big ninth grade year, and everybody was telling him how great he was. Uh, I was at a camp, and I made Leonard stand on the football, and he couldn't stand on the football. He kept falling in front of all these children, the number one kid there. And he, he didn't know what I was doing. And I had two other kids come up and help him stand on the football. Then he fell off it again. Then I put a book down. I made him stand on the book. And I told everybody back off, so you can stand on that by yourself. I said, see that football? It's only temporary. It's fun. It's temporary. But you can't stand on it forever. That education, you're going to be able to stand. And Leonard said that in the, in, uh, on Twitter and told him, he said, man, my coach taught me that in the eighth grade. I never forgot it. At the end of the day, bro, you know, at, you know, you tell these kids about the pros, man, what you going to do for the rest of 40, 65 years of your life, man? You know, the pros going to come and go. That's going to be four or five years and it's over with. Then what? You know, and a lot of people don't talk to the kids like that. And the kids looking for some real substance at this time. Right. And I'm real passionate about this subject I'm about to ask you about kids picking schools for the wrong reasons. I see it all the time. Uh, You know, I, I, I just feel like with social media and, you know, some of these people that's advising these kids, they picking schools for the wrong reason. And you see some, so many kids transferring after a year or two because ultimately they pick these schools for the wrong reasons. Um, what, what, what's some conversations you kind of have with kids about understanding the process and picking schools for the right reason? Not, and not just football related, just understanding the town that you're living in, understanding yeah. the university and, and all of those dynamics. Well, I, I tell them, this is a secret I tell a lot of kids, man. I say, listen, bro, you really want to know about your coach, the guys who are recruiting, especially the guy who's going, not just as a recruiter, but the guy who's going to coach you. And they're like, yeah, coach, tell me to see you. I said, let me tell you this. I said, look on the roster, find a walk-on. Find a walk-on in this position. Call that walk-on and really talk to him. However you treat that walk-on, that's what's going to tell you who he, what he's about. So I'm just telling you how this thing go. I'm just going to tell you how, what it's really about, man. I said, so at the end of the day, you can kind of figure out and find out about, about a person when they do things like that. And you got to pick someone. I tell kids, go away, you celebrate and not tolerate because that's where you're going to play. At the end of the day, it don't matter. And I tell kids, bro, if you're good enough and you really want to go to the NFL, the NFL don't look at ESPN, they're going to find you. If you can play, bro, they're going to find you. That's just how this thing works. So you can go somewhere and just say it look good on signing day, and three years from now, we're like, oh, the dude ain't never played. And you just keep coming home with your gear and all that kind of stuff, and you never playing. It's not going to be fun. Right. So you look at the roster. You look how many seniors they have, juniors they have in your position. You look how that coach developed those kids. That's the number one thing you look at. Not the best kids he recruited. What happened after he recruited them? Did they fall off? Did they develop into something? And I say, I'm not just talking about they develop and all of them went to the NFL, but just did they develop into good players? Did they graduate from college? Do we have a good relationship with his players? So, you know, that, that I tell them a lot. And I just try to tell kids, ask real questions. And most kids don't ask real questions. Do y'all right. go to Nike? Or do y'all have this? Or do, they don't ask real questions, man. And, and you can ask a coach sometimes, like, look, coach, you like me? What do I need to improve on? Most coaches are going to sit there, oh, I think. It's not, they're not going to know how to evaluate them. They're not going to know what's going to get me better. And that's the one thing I do with kids. And even kids who decide, well, coach, I'm going to go to this school. Cool, man. I'm going to still help you, whatever I can do to help you. So I just think that's one way it is always having a real relationship with them and being mindful of what's going on and not telling them what they want to hear. And some kids get mad with you for a few months and they'll call you back. Right, so I'm just telling you, man, I lie to you. Dave, man, you got a lot of knowledge, a lot of different experience you didn't went through in, in, in this football game and in life that you can share with all these kids. And I know you say your end game is to be a principal, but, but I, I was hoping you were going to tell me to be a head coach at a university. Nah, I definitely want to be a head coach now, but you said at the end when it's all over with. I definitely want to be a head coach. You know, I tell people that all the time. Uh, I want to be a head coach. I want to be a head coach in college. People said, well, if it's this school, I said, I just want to find the best fit. Whatever's well, a good fit for me, man, wherever God allow me and bless me to be a head coach one day, if that happens, man, that's what I want to do. You know, that's the, that's the ultimate thing. That's the ultimate goal. You know, you want to see if you could do it for yourself and get your staff together and uh, develop your staff and develop kids, man. That's why we're in this. Gotcha. Dave Johnson, Florida State running back coach on the Zoom segment with G Sports. This is the fun part of the segment, Dave. 
got a, I got a couple fun questions for you. All right. Talk to me. Favorite football player of all time and why? And it can't be Tyron Matthew. <laughs> My favorite football player of all time. To me, it had to be Jerry Rice. Uh, that's somebody, as I was playing football, who I just admired. I just watched him. Uh, I just watched him just be so consistent with everything. You know? And I just watched a lot of his old tapes and different things that he did. And most people, I was coming up with stuff, even though I was at Walker, with double sticking on a hitch route. If he was in a shotgun and they were playing soft cover, it was like, cool, I had never seen it. But I had seen Jerry Rice do it in like 87, 88 or whatever. But Jerry Rice was just really consistent, man. He probably that's, – that's the player who I just love. He, he never dropped balls, man. Favorite coach of all, all time and why? Coach George Haynes. Coach George Haynes is my coach at Gregory. He okay. changed my life, man. Like, he was a dude – and he did it in a way – he was a different type of coach. He would pull you along and not push you. He knew how to motivate you. Uh, he was a really good coach. Uh, I still talk to him to this day. Man, Coach Haynes inspired me a lot. He was also my eighth grade uh, earth science teacher. Uh, and I watched him deal with me and kind of help me along. And actually, what, three or four years ago, we, I was at Memphis. We came out to play Tulane. Him and his wife came to the game. We took a picture with my son. Uh, but George Haynes at Gregory, bro, he changed the game for me, man. And ever since then, that's when I was like, that's what made me really want to be a teacher. I seen the impact he had on me and the way he did it. It was different, you know, and that's what probably what I needed at that time, around the eighth or ninth grade at Gregory, man. But George Haynes, was, man, that's my favorite coach. Favorite NFL team of all time and why? Well, it's got to be the Saints, man. You it's know, it's got to be the – it's got to – it's when I was young, I used to love the Steelers. But, man, when you look at them Saints, especially after that storm and that block punt, it just changed it for me. And then knowing CJ was there, I can remember being out there after that Super Bowl and that cold weather for that parade. Me and my wife was out there forever. But just seeing how it brought the city together. I love seeing our city going to them games and how we cook and do different things. But it's just a part of us. So, you know, the Saints, I just think they, they, they do a lot. I love Sean Payton. I've been able to be in meetings and practice and watch him, bro. So, I mean, it has to be the Saints. Favorite NBA player of all time and why? Favorite NBA player will probably have to be, a, you know, the GOAT, man, Michael Jordan. You know, he just – he changed it just even off the – you know, with the shoes and everything. I could just see – what I mean, he worked hard. Didn't have to watch in that last dance. I was like, man, this dude was on. This dude was on another level. And most people didn't understand that, but the dude wanted to win. And what he did – he made his teammates, you know, he, he brought them to his level. And they won. And, and ultimately, that's what they wanted to do. And that level in professional sports, you're not trying to make friends. You're trying to win. You're trying to right. feed your family. And, I, and, and Jordan was always my best NBA player. Before you're getting ready to play in the game, well, not playing the game, coaching the game, uh, you know, like when you was at Tennessee last year, say y'all about to play Bama. What coach Dave listening to, man, the headphones, man, on the way to the stadium? To get you hyped before the game. What you listening now, to, man? I'm, I'm always listening to that cash money, dog. I'm always, you know, that old school cash money, man. I'm always listening to them boys, man. I just, I try to keep everything. I'm going to listen to a little mystical here and there, bro. But that cash money, some no limit stuff, bro. But them dudes, just watching them and understanding where they came from and not seeing them on a level like this, bro. And, and I can hear, all, you know, a part of everybody from New Orleans in their music. Last question. Who but can't say Tyron. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Best high school player in Louisiana history that you ever seen with your own eyes. Daryl Johnson. You can't say Tyron is Daryl Johnson. It's not even close. And it, most people don't know this. And actually, Jalou coached Daryl. And uh, and actually, I'm gonna tell you a story bro, about Daryl Johnson. He was playing DB, he had always played DB, played free safety. So I was a little in shape when I was at Walker. I was in shape a little bit, still running a little bit. So Frank tricked him. And Frank was in practice, everybody getting hyped. My receiver was doing good. And he told Darryl Johnson, he said, if you can bump Coach Dave coming off the line, we don't have practice the next day. I said, Darryl, I ain't going to go for that. 
I said, Daryl, you're not going to even touch me coming off the line. And everybody started laughing. He would laugh like, Coach, you old. Man, that boy tried to bump me. I double stuck on him and did something. He went that way. And that kid said, Coach, you got to teach me that. And he started playing receiver for us that year. And that kid had 1,300 yards receiving, 12 intercepts, seven kickoff return, and like 10 punt return in one year. He never tied his shoes in practice, and he never buckled his shoulder pads. And I used to be so mad with him at practice. No, he used to tell me, Coach, get on my back. I'm going to take you to the dome. Just get on my back. And I started the Dow. I talked to him now. I know he was over there with uh, at Wright. He was the offensive coordinator, man, with uh, Dennis. But it, it wasn't uh, – if you can't say Tyron, Daryl Johnson was the dude, man. Wrong man. Man, I'm, I, I'm – because, you know, I graduated in 2003, so I remember Daryl. <laughs> um, I, I was just so upset that we never got to see him play at a Division One school, bro. I mean, I remember Leron, me and Leron Landry was real good friends. Leron Landry, see, that was you never one. heard of him. <laughs> he, yep. say, he, he was like, man, Darryl going to Miami? Uh-uh, I ain't going to. <laughs> yeah, because all of them went down there committed at the same time. And then they came back to LSU and Leron, I tell you, man, I tell people, I said, dog, you'd have never heard of Leron now. You'd have been playing another position. Daryl Johnson would have said, Nick Saban to tell you that. See, he was one of the best high school football players he ever, he ever seen. And DJ, DJ was a dude, bro. And that whole team, bro, kind of changed most of our lives, bro, all those coaches on that staff. And even those kids, not Keenan Lewis, head coach. Dennis, head coach. So, you know, John Johnson, big-time offensive coordinator in the city. So. I just think that was that was big, man. I thought I thought Frank Wilson just did a really good job uh, understanding the the neighborhood, understanding kids, and understanding how to help us. And one person who actually put all that together, and Frank will tell you, is Big Shane, the principal. You know, Shane was the one, bro. He kept us in check, bro. I ain't gonna lie to you. You know, shout out to Big Shane, man. He he really kept all of us in check, being young, wild coaches at the time, bro. And he, he groomed all of us, man. And I'm forever thankful to him. Man, Dave, I appreciate you, man, taking the time out your busy schedule, man, to come on the G Sports Zone segment, man. Uh, you know, stay safe, man. Uh, hopefully we have a season so we can see y'all get that dang rolling on there, Tallahassee. <laughs> well, that's, about that's the plan, man. It looked like they just put out a schedule today. So, Look like we about to do something, man. We all excited, bro. We we can't wait and get the kids back. And and obviously, man, we want to be safe though. You know, that's the number one thing. Keep everybody safe, especially the kids and their families, man. We don't want to do anything that, that's gonna put anybody in uh harm's way. So we we playing it smart, doing the things that we need to do, man, and just hopefully we all stay prayed up and hope we can get the season off. Well, I'm definitely gonna be keeping a close eye on y'all, man. Uh hopefully, man, we could we could do another Zoom interview. In the near future, bro. Good luck to y'all in this season, man, and stay safe, Coach Dave. Man, thank you, G. I appreciate everything, man. Have a good one. There it is, man. We signing out. All right, baby. Appreciate it.